We have ignition. We have liftoff. Let's say you've saved up 200 grand for a trip to space with Virgin Galactic. Lucky you. But are you healthy enough to fly? You'll have to talk with your doctor. A new study in the BMJ outlines the role that general practitioners will have to play in commercial spaceflight. After all, astronauts typically have to be in tip-top shape. But opening the door to the paying public means that less healthy individuals will soon have access to space, too. And the stress of spaceflight, combined with the negative effects of weightlessness on muscle and bone, could cause real problems. It may be up to your personal physician to make the go, no-go call based on your medical history. Among the potential hypotheticals floated in the BMJ study, can my patient with stable angina and a pacemaker for complete heart block participate in a suborbital Virgin Galactic flight? What is the maximum allowable time that my patient with osteoporosis can spend on a planned vacation at a space hotel? There are no official answers, yet, but the study's authors note that such questions may be in the air, or lack thereof, in the not-too-distant future. It's a given that most babies wear diapers, in Western cultures anyway. But diapers may trap more than waste. They may also confine a baby's ability to walk. Scientists compared the walking gaits of 60 babies who were either naked, wore a thin disposable diaper, or a thick cloth diaper. Half the babies were 13-month-old novice walkers and the other half 19-month-old experienced walkers. When the 30 13-month-olds walked naked, only 10 fell. But while wearing the cloth diaper, 21 of them fell. And while wearing the disposable, 17 of them fell. Among the 19-month-olds, only 4 fell while naked or wearing disposables, while 8 fell while wearing cloth diapers. But both age groups took wider and shorter steps while wearing diapers as opposed to walking naked. The research is in the journal Developmental Science. The study can't predict if wearing diapers has a long-term impact. Nonetheless, the researchers believe walking naked would speed up walking development. But then we are left with the issue of covering the entire house in plastic and relying heavily on the child's ability to communicate his or her elimination intentions. It's a given that most babies wear diapers, in Western cultures anyway, but diapers may trap more than waste. They may also confine a baby's ability to walk. Scientists compared the walking gaits of 60 babies who were either naked, wore a thin disposable diaper, or a thick cloth diaper. Half the babies were 13-month-old novice walkers and the other half 19-month-old experienced walkers. When the 30 13-month-olds walked naked, only 10 fell. But while wearing the cloth diaper, 21 of them fell. And while wearing the disposable, 17 of them fell. Among the 19-month-olds, only 4 fell while naked or wearing disposables, while 8 fell while wearing cloth diapers. But both age groups took wider and shorter steps while wearing diapers as opposed to walking naked. The research is in the journal Developmental Science. The study can't predict if wearing diapers has a long-term impact. Nonetheless, the researchers believe walking naked would speed up walking development. But then we are left with the issue of covering the entire house in plastic and relying heavily on the child's ability to communicate his or her elimination intentions. Unless you're at a Chaucer convention, speaking Middle English is not going to impress a potential romantic partner in 2013. Similarly, male savanna sparrows have to make sure their vocalizations are up to date. Researchers analyzed three decades of recordings of male savanna sparrows, 
and birds that change their tune over the years did better with the ladies. The research is in the journal Animal Behavior. While introductory notes of the sparrow song stayed the same, the middle and end parts changed over time. In the 1980s, songs concluded with longer, high-pitched trills. More recent songs contain a series of clicks in the middle and a shorter, low-pitched trill at the end. Researchers found that the male sparrows that adopted the newer songs had higher rates of sexual reproduction because you don't want to be seen as behind the times. Indeed, Chaucer might have had his pick of the ladies in the 14th century, but few today can make heads or tails of his tales. Mystery of Shakespeare. For all his fame and celebration, William Shakespeare remains a mysterious figure with regards to personal history. There are just two primary sources for information on the Bard, his works and various legal and church documents that have survived from Elizabethan times. Naturally, there are many gaps in this body of information, which tells us little about Shakespeare the man. In this tutorial, we will show you how to find specific journal articles using the library catalog. The university subscribes to over 18,000 journals across a variety of subjects, most of which are available electronically to find a specific journal article using a library catalog. We need to search by the journal name as individual article titles are not listed in the catalog. I think it's really important for young people not to feel restricted in their choices, and also to be aware of the choices that are available to them, and obviously the media has an incredibly important role to play in that. I think we tend to talk about science as this big kind of monolith, but of course actually it's this beautiful multifaceted thing. You know there's almost something for everybody there, and there are so many different aspects of it. You know, somebody that's going to be attracted to working in biology might be a very different person from somebody who's attracted to engineering. I suppose it's about knowing the breadth of opportunities that are out there. And so anything that universities and broadcast media can do to make sure that those opportunities are visible. To begin with, you should be standing in the main floor of the British Library. British Library, situated in the Euston Road, next to some pipe crustacean press, in the foyer to the left of the information desk. It was a large white staircase. Follow this up towards the gallery at the top of the stairs. Pause and look to your left for attention. This is Robert Cotton, born in 1570 and died in 1631. Cotton was a member of Parliament, but he's mainly known as a great antiquarian collector of manuscripts. It is the covenant we have a great depth and the survival of many English manuscripts. Morality and climate change. Okay, so let's have a quick summary, because we've galloped through a bit of philosophy here. I've suggested that we're rationally required to do what morality requires of us, so it's a reason that tells us what we should and shouldn't do. If we don't do what rationally requires of us, this is because we're ignorant 
Or, if you don't agree with Aristotle or Socrates, we are possibly weak or corrupt, and we may be ignorant of what morality requires of us because we are relying on others. So what's all this got to do with climate change? I think what, what is most remarkable about Dexter is his capacity for stress management. Michael C. Hall, in a conversation about his TV character at the Rubin Museum of Art in New York City on October 24th, he spoke with psychologist Kevin Dutton, author of The Wisdom of Psychopaths. And, and I think that's, that's because of his ability to, as the heat goes up, his... Absolutely internal temperature goes down. Yeah, he, yeah. He, the, the crazier things get, the cooler he feels. He almost craves chaos. He, he seems to attract it, cultivate it, mm. encourage it, because it's the only thing that somehow soothes him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very realistic, actually, because what you find is it, that the more chaotic a situation, the more that psychopaths have to make decisions under pressure. Uh, the better their decision-making gets, and we've seen it with Dexter, the more the, the, the pressure builds, the cooler he gets. And that is exactly what you see with psychopaths, it really is. Beneath its adorable exterior, is your cat hiding the heart of a killer? Researchers now estimate that each year, domestic cats kill billions of birds and mammals in the United States alone. The report is in Nature Communications. We already knew that domestic cats can wreak havoc on islands, causing 14% of species extinctions and ranking as one of the world's 100 worst invasive species. But now, scientists have reviewed previous studies to find just how much damage cats do on the mainland. Cats kill some 1.4 to 3.7 billion birds and 6.9 to 20.7 billion small mammals in the U.S. each year. These numbers mean that felines may be the biggest human-related cause of death for American birds and mammals. And cats tend to prey on native species. Species, which can cause major ecosystem damage. The worst feline killers are those without owners, and reducing feral cat populations is an ongoing problem, but you can still reduce the impact of domestic cats by keeping your pet indoors, thus leaving the neighborhood a little less red in tooth and claw. <laughs> Last week on the podcast, we talked about space health. Specifically, we told you about a new paper discussing the role that physicians will have to play in determining which citizens are fit enough for commercial jaunts into space. Now let's leap ahead and much farther afield. What kinds of issues might a crew of astronauts face on a longer journey, say, a round trip to Mars? To find out, six volunteers spent a record 520 days confined to a simulated space habitat near Moscow. They emerged in 2011. Now, a report in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences shows that the simulated spaceflight did have real effects. Removed from natural light and the rhythms of everyday life, four crew members experienced some type of sleep disturbance, and one exhibited signs of chronic sleep deprivation during regular alertness tests. Overall, the crew also became more sedentary with time. The researchers conclude that a real Mars mission would need to incorporate tactics such as timed light exposure or exercise to keep astronauts' circadian rhythms on beat, because it would be a bad idea to land on Mars sleepy and out of shape. Medicinal tablets are nothing new. Doctors have been dispensing pills for thousands of years. 
And now archaeologists have turned up some of those ancient medicines, which were preserved in a shipwreck for close to two millennia. The second century Pozzino wreck was discovered in 1974 off the coast of Italy. Its cargo included medical equipment, like a cupping vessel, iron probe, and tin boxes of supplies. And in one of those boxes, researchers recovered five gray tablets. Now they've analyzed the antique medication. The work is in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The pills primarily contain zinc compounds, probably the active medicinal ingredients, but researchers also detected starch, pollen, charcoal, fats, and linen fibers. Those fibers help the tablets hold their round, loaf-like shape, which may be the key to the medication's use. The Greek word, meaning small round loaves, also inspired the word calerium, or eyewash. The pills were probably either dissolved in liquid or ground into a powder and used to treat eye conditions. Who knows, maybe Hippocrates used them on his pupils. Kids today may be more familiar with the sound of a rushing highway than a rushing river. But imagine that the internal combustion engine could be set aside and we could design the soundscape of our future. What oral environment would you choose for traffic? For the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, the answer is that new cars should sound like old cars. Hybrid and electric vehicles can be so quiet that people outside the vehicle can't hear them. So these two quiet cars will be required to sound something like this. The Obama administration wants a million electric vehicles on the road by 2015. Slow sales of cars like the Chevy Volt and Tesla Model S may keep that number from being reached. But there are still hundreds of thousands of EVs and hybrids on the road today. It's hoped that the new rule will help prevent thousands of pedestrian and cyclist deaths. But the rule also hews to a possibly outdated tradition, like people who set their cell phone ringtone to sound like an old rotary phone. And it's wasting a chance to reimagine what our cars, roads, and even cities could sound like. When you don't clean your plate, microbes feast. And Americans are awfully good at feeding microbes, wasting some 222 million metric tons of food every year. That's a quarter of our food. Much of that wasted food ends up in garbage dumps, turned by microbes into methane, a powerful greenhouse gas and one of the primary culprits behind global warming. Now government officials in Massachusetts would like to ensure that restaurants, universities, hospitals, and other large institutions don't exacerbate that problem. The idea is to make sure all that wasted food doesn't end up in landfills, but instead becomes either compost or energy. The same microbes that turn food into methane in a landfill can turn food into methane in a biodigester, and that methane can then be used as a fuel. More importantly, from the Bay State's perspective, it will keep the state's landfills from filling up. Of course, the methane from landfills can also be harvested, and often is. And as the pilgrims knew, it would be even smarter not to waste the food in the first place. But let's give thanks for another helping of new ways to curb climate change. An Arctic storm tore a drilling rig loose from its tow ship and forced it aground near Alaska's Kodiak Island this week. Just a few months ago, the rig and another began preliminary drilling of the first offshore oil wells in the Arctic. Shell's efforts to drill in the Beaufort and Chukchi Seas have been plagued by problems, but that's just part of the cost of doing energy business in this new era. Consider drilling rig operator Transocean, which agreed to pay the U.S. government $1.4 billion this week for its part in the disastrous three-month-long blowout in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. 
Meanwhile, the thirst for oil drives the mining of tar sands in Alberta and the flooding of old wells with steam or CO2 in California and Texas. And, of course, there's the accelerating accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere from all that fossil fuel burning. The resulting climate change is part of what makes drilling for oil offshore in the unfreezing Arctic possible, just as it has opened once mythical shipping routes such as the Northwest and Northeast passages. That's a positive feedback loop with negative consequences. (laughs) 